Hi, everybody. And thank you so much for taking some of your valuable time to attend this uh, webinar this evening, which I think is going to be extremely fascinating. So our speaker tonight, who's going to be talking about getting the eye ready for specialty lens success, is Paul Karpecki. Uh, Paul is the director of the cornea and external disease at Kentucky Eye Institute in, and also at the Carmel, Indiana Center for Sight. Uh, he's an associate professor at UPike uh, Kentucky College of Optometry and the uh, medical director of uh, Kepler Vision. Uh, besides that, Paul is a wonderful guy. I'm very glad to uh, look at him as a colleague and as a friend, and this is really going to be great to have you here tonight. Paul, thank you so much for participating. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, certainly, the friendship has been something that's uh, been with us a long time. I remember, you know, early on in my life, I, when I first was dating my my wife to be, and we spent time Greece, other areas. You've been a long time friend, so I'm honored to get to to uh, join a, a great colleague like you in terms of uh, this presentation. I'm also commend ABB Optical because for they're known for contact lenses, just like you are, Craig. The fact that they are, you know, understanding the importance of all areas and how it plays a role, I think, says a lot about you know the, their ability to want to do best for the doctor. So uh, you already gave me a great introduction. These are my financial disclosures of companies I do research with, advisory boards, anything in the last three years. Perhaps a lot of them I'm not currently doing research with or on the board, but I want to include everything from the last three years encompassing. So obviously we, we know this, dry eye disease, the most common disease we're going to deal with. They say about 38 million people is the most recent update on longitudinal studies in the U.S., which yes, 30 to 50 million is a good range, but I found a more a recent statistic that said 38. We diagnose about 16 to 17 million patients per year, which quite frankly is impressive. Uh, you're not gonna get them all because we don't have enough patients coming in every single time. But, but the fact that we're getting 16 to 17 million, you think about glaucoma, which is important to treat, but it's 2.7 million. Uh, this is 10 times the size. 42% of all eye exams, including those for specialty contact lenses, have complaints that are either primary or secondary that sound exactly like dry eye, dryness, grittiness, burning, fluctuating vision. So we would estimate that <clears throat> four out of you know our 10 exams are gonna be related to dry eye disease as a whole. One of the things we have to understand when we're preparing the eye for scleral lens success is that the entire system, the lacrimal function, functional unit works together, meaning the tear film, the lacrimal glands, the conjunctival epithelia, including goblet cells that produce mucin, the meibomian glands, all work together to function. This controlled, which we call homeostasis when it's in balance, by nerve connections and even our systemic hormones like our androgens. So it is one complete unit. And I've, I've been reminded of this every day in clinic. I see patients that come in and I have over 600 uh, positive diagnosed uh, Sjogren's syndrome patients in my clinic. The only reason I even would know that stat is we had a study <clears throat> on Sjogren's patients uh, that came up and we and they actually went through our ICD-10s to see how many I had in my clinic and it was 605. And that was about five months ago, so it's probably a little more than that now, but point being that I see those patients, they have very few myobomian glands left, which means how, you know, we think of Sjogren's as more aqueous deficient, mucin deficient, the fact that the myobomian glands are gone says it's all one functional unit. If I had to give you one pearl about success when it comes to specialty lens and scleral lens fitting, it's really right here. You have to begin with the eyelid in mind or the lid in mind. 86% of all ocular surface issues involve the eyelid. So you're gonna be wrong only 14% of the time by looking at the importance of the eyelid and how it contributes to your success in this area. Sometimes it's something as simple as frothy tear film. If you look in the, the eyelids and you're about to think of a contact lens, you see this frothy tear film there's really no other diagnosis than meibomian gland dysfunction. What's happening is the lipids are not quite accurate and not quite as quality as they should be. And so what happens is the enzymes that are present in the bacteria react with those poor or not quite quality oils, they result in what's something called saponification. And you know, when you think about that, you think when patients come in with a lot of MGD, they complain about burning. Saponification is like having soap in the eye it all kinds of fits well, but it's a wonderful way to make a quick diagnosis. In fact, this is one of the earliest signs of meibomian gland dysfunction. As the disease progresses, you start to see more signs. To give you an example of how important it is to just concentrate on the eyelid, just in this one single image, I'm gonna show you at least three or four key findings that only take a few seconds to pick up. 
Number one, you see what's called a volcano sign. These are, when you have a lot of biofilm, even cholerets that are caused by Demodex, you get, when the lash starts to grow and the, and the biofilm is sitting within, within the follicle, it actually grows out with it. So you get this kind of sign as it's coming out, which is a good indicator. You also notice if you look at the blood vessels there, those are telangiectatic vessels. Those are indicative of ocular rosacea, which tells you you have a much more inflammatory prone eye. And if you look at the meibomian glands, there's a couple of things that stand out here. One, they're very posterior, and that indicates a more progressive meibomian gland disease. You also see that many of the glands are capped. And that, again, tells you you're not going to have a good oil layer. And without a good oil layer, it's very difficult to have success in your contact lens fitting. So even in this one simple image, we had four things, the posterior positioned meibomian glands, the cap glands, the telangiectatic vessels, and the blepharitis that is, is evident by those essentially cholerats or volcano that comes out with the lashes. Now, it's also real important to look, have a patient look down slightly when you're doing your exam. Uh, what's interesting about this case is that this patient, I wish I had the pre-shot, if you looked at her straight on, you would actually not see any blepharitis because her lashes actually look good until she started looking down. And then you see this incredible clear sleeve base, which is known as cholerets, which is indicative of a demodex blepharitis. Your chances of, of contact lens success with this level of demodex are extremely low. So being able to pick up on these conditions plays a key role. It's also important to know that just because you might have a lot of good glands, like you see in this image, and mybography is helpful, doesn't necessarily mean that they function well. I've had patients where I tried to express the meibomian glands, and remember, expression really only involves about 10 seconds of testing. That's it. You take your fingers or you take a paddle like a Mistrota paddle or a Collins forceps. There's a whole bunch of expressor technologies, my Bohmian gland evacuator. What I do is I like the paddle because I've been working with it for about 10 or 12 years. Place it behind the lower nasal to central my Bohmian gland. Temporal glands on human beings don't tend to work well. Corb has shown that in many of his studies. And so we typically just focus on the lower eyelid right here. And you press against the glands and you look for what comes out. If it's like olive oil, fantastic. If it's not expressing, that's much more severe. Gelat turbid, gelatinous expression, toothpaste is in between, and non-expression, as I mentioned, is the most advanced case. I've seen cases like this that didn't express, and I've, of course, seen cases like this that don't express. Now, when I look at patients that are this far along, and this is the majority of what get, gets referred into my clinic, you, you can't give up on a patient that's this far advanced. I've had some of them still wear, wear scleral lenses very successfully. The studies have shown that you only need about five and a half glands on average, so let's say six, producing liquid secretions like olive oil to be functional, to be able to wear a contact lens. There are some studies that show with soft lenses and RGPs that perhaps you need a few more, somewhere around 10 to 12. But nevertheless, it's kind of like glaucoma. If you have a patient who comes in with a 0.9 CD, they've lost a third of their visual field. None of us would say, I'm sorry, you're too advanced. You're going to go blind. We'll see you later. Yet when it comes to advanced ocular surface disease or dry eye, we do that. We tend to let these patients say, well, that's really bad. I don't know what we can do to help you. This is when you really need to be aggressive in terms of managing this condition. You also have to keep in mind that dry eye disease is called immune mediated disease. It's based on the immune system, which we've I had to learn a lot about in the last year with COVID, where the body goes from what's called innate immunity, which is you're born with, to what's called adaptive immunity. Adaptive immunity means your T cells are primed. So anytime you have any sort of insult on the surface, including contact lens wear, the T cells are ready to act it and, and produce cytokines and rev up, so to speak. So you want to really prevent that from happening. It's kind of along the lines of another immune mediated disease with adaptive immunity known as uveitis. None of us would ever use an artificial tear to treat someone with iritis. It's the same thing in ocular surface disease, especially dry eye. So I've seen patients that come in on the top that look pretty normal and do well and don't have good expression, and patients on the bottom that have no glands left. The goal is really to prevent going to that lower level due to the inflammation of dry eye disease. So before we get into kind of diagnosis, before we get into how do you treat this, how do you prepare the ocular surface for specialty lens success. Let me open it up to any questions you might have on kind of the generality of dry eye and how it plays a role with specialty lenses.
So, Paul, to begin with, there's a, a question which is kind of a general question, and that is that the uh, lacrimal functional unit or the LFU is a term the person asking this question wasn't that familiar with. Is this is this terminology common? Great question. It's actually not common. That actually came from one of the top researchers in the role of inflammation and understanding how the, the ocular surface works from a dry eye perspective. <clears throat> he's a PhD at, at Baylor and he's an MD. He's known as, his name is Steve Flugfelter. Steve is one of the top experts in understanding the role of, <clears throat> excuse me, inflammation surrounding dry eye disease. And he was the one that postulated the LFU. <clears throat> It's not well known, but what's really interesting about this is that the more you work in the field of dry eye, the more you manage advanced patients, the more you do specialty lenses for this category of patients, the more you understand that that is, although not very well known, and I commend the person for asking because it is really not well known, you realize how accurate that is, that everything is interconnected and they all work together. And sometimes your worst Sjogren's patients who have lacrimal gland deficiency and mucin gland deficiency, have the worst meibomian gland images. In fact, that myography that only had those few nubs left over is a Sjogren syndrome patient, which just emphasizes how all the glands work together. In fact, the meibomian glands in a Sjogren's patient have to kind of run a marathon every day. And so they burn out a lot quicker. Everything works together. And so that's why it's so important that the moment you start to see ocular surface issues that you do prepare that. And contact lenses, albeit a wonderful solution and a true treatment. In fact, the most successful treatment we have for severe ocular surface disease is scleral lenses <clears throat> actually can contribute to the problem if the ocular surface is not well prepared. And so it all works together. Okay, excellent. I agree with you. Um, I'm glad somebody asked that question. I wasn't that familiar with the terminology uh, as well. And thank you also for tying that into the use of why it's important of looking at and how it can prepare the surface for scleral lenses. So that's it for right now. Remember everybody, if you have questions, please type them into the question box and Dr. Karpecki will try to answer them at the next question break. Sounds great. Yeah, I love that someone asked that because it isn't a familiar term, but it gave us a great opportunity to get into it. You know, what's really fascinating to me is how much we've progressed. This is a survey that was actually published as a study in 2014 that looked at the most common diagnostic tools utilized for dry eye disease, including those who are focusing on specialty lenses because they had a wide array of, of respondents. In, and it's actually included ophthalmologists, optometrists, contact lens uh, specialists, et cetera. And it's fascinating to think that just literally seven, you know, seven, eight years ago, because we're early into 2021, so let's say really more along the lines of six and a half years kind of into this history. That's not going to give you a lot unless you really know your directed questions. Tear breakup time makes some sense, but probably no, no one timed it. Shermer's test, that was mostly in the ophthalmology category, and sodium and fluorescein, sodium fluorescein staining was all that was mentioned. Well, that being said, I still agree with a lot of it. I still use sodium fluorescein staining. I still use tear film breakup, and I still use patient history, but I don't use Shermer's. Let me take you through the next level of where we're at today. What we've realized is that it's real important to have some sort of symptom. You can't have dry eye or ocular surface issues unless you have symptoms to go with the signs. If you only had symptoms and nothing else and everything looked perfect, that's known as a neuropathic form of a corneal neuralgia. If you had a person with terrible signs but no symptoms, that's neurotrophic keratitis. So in order to have dry eye, you have to have both. So having a questionnaire ahead of time, DEQ5, Speed, are you asking the appropriate, appropriate directed questions, I think is key. If you're really into dry eye, things like osmolarity and myography help. Now, do you need those? Of course not. If you're just going to really focus on, on specialty lens fitting and you want the best ocular surface, I don't think you need those tests. If you're in a clinic like mine where, where you're going to see 40, 50 advanced referred in patients you know, from a, a big area, yeah, it does help me differentiate what's going on. So let's take out two and three for most practices because I think you would evolve to that if necessary and it may not be necessary. Number four is critical, but we're all doing it, slit lamp exam. But I want you to focus like I showed you earlier on the eyelids like we, we showed. Really, really get into looking for those volcano signs. Look for collarettes at the base of lashes. Look for telangiectatic vessels, which indicate, indicate a much more inflammatory response can occur with your specialty lenses. 
look to see what kind of meibomian glands are there, express the glands to see what comes out of them. That alone takes only 20 to 30 seconds, but it's so critical to your exam. I love this new test that's come out recently called the KB light test. Of course, so much of what I reference comes from Don Korb. He, he was like a decade ahead of everybody when it came to understanding meibomian gland dysfunction. So he had a decade of publication. So every time you reference somebody, it tends to be him because of that. He did this test, and I'll show you in a moment, where you take light in a dark room and you put it at the top of the eyelid and you look for a beam of light coming down. What that indicates is that our eyelids close like our teeth. One is on top of the other, creating a tight seal at nighttime. And in a significant percentage of patients, especially those who have trouble with contact lenses, they have this gap. Uh, it's almost like an overbite and light goes through and they tend to have a lot more problems. We'll cover that in a moment. You have to express my bombing glands. It's one of the simplest tests, but it's the number one reason patients have trouble with specialty lenses is that they don't have good oils. The oil layer is incredibly thin when it comes to the volume of, of your tear lake and, and your tears as a whole being aqueous mucin complex. It's just that very thin too much 20 micron layer at the top. I mean, it's the equivalent. If you imagine a football field, you know, of, of and again, this comes from Corb's work, but if you imagine a football field being aqueous mucin, 100 yards, I'm not kidding you, the scale of the lipid layer would be dental floss. So it's a very, very small layer at the top. So you have to have it though, in order to, to be successful, in specialty lenses. The only way to know it's there is by pressing on the glands. Is it olive oil or is it toothpaste or non-expressive? And you look at this and, and you think, well, you know, honestly, this is a fairly simplistic diagnostic regimen. All you're doing is one questionnaire or one question directed, questions directed at the patient. And my only questions are, you know, what's your worst symptom and when is it worse? I kid you not, that's all I ask for the most part. I do a slit lamp exam, which we're already doing. I do the light test, when I especially when I have morning symptoms, but I may not do it on everybody. So the only thing that's new is expressing the meibomian glands and putting fluorescein dye in. And even fluorescein dye isn't that new. You'll notice I don't have lysamine. I found that if I have a, a number 12 rat and filter, yellow filter, I can see the same amount of conjunctival staining as when I used to use lysamine green. So in the, in the essence of efficiency, I really only do these things. So technically the only thing I'm doing different because you're already doing slit lamp, you're already doing your history, is my bone gland expression and fluorescein, that's it. A lot of people come to my clinic, they say, Dr. Peggy, I thought you had this real extensive dry eye clinic uh, you're seeing all these extreme patients. How is the only thing you do is expression and staining? Well, I do osmolarity, but not me. Someone does it ahead of time. The answer is, it goes back to saying you've probably heard before. It's a famous quote from Mark Twain that I absolutely love. It says, you know, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. And I love that quote because if I go back in my career, I started my first dry clinic in 1997. And if I look at the testing I did in, let's say, 2000, it was so extensive. It was the long letter. I was like doing everything you could do. And patients were like, wow, this is a lot of stuff. And it didn't really help me. And over the last you know, 20 years or 24 years, I've figured out how to make the shorter letter. And this is it. This is all you need to do. Now you look at that and you think, well, are you sure this is very scientific, Paul? You don't have a lot of stuff in here. Yes, your fluorescein staining shows tear meniscus, corneal staining, conjunctival staining with the rat and filter. I don't measure tight tear film breakup time. I don't sit there with a stopwatch. I glance at it. Well, the answer is yes. In fact, the entire TFOS dues to diagnostic methodology subsection, 77 pages. I'm going to save you 77 pages of reading. It's pretty much what we just discussed. Now, I'm on this committee, so I'm a little bit biased. I was part of this committee. But to be fair, they didn't just say, okay, let's take Paul's system. They actually had all kinds of insights and all kinds of research. In fact, what I was doing was not as good as this. They took it and we all put in, put in, we came up with, I think, one of the best diagnostic methodologies that exist for dry eye and for specialty lens preparation, because that is the number one reason patients have issues with specialty lenses is dry eye. So let's take you through it. First thing is triaging questions. This is for a general clinic that's trying to identify these patients or you're fitting specialty lenses. What are the best questions to ask a patient? I'm actually gonna take a list that came from the Dry Eye Summit of Optometry in December, 2014. And I still rely on this. These are my five favorite questions for identifying dry eye. How do your eyes feel? As in burning, dry, gritty, et cetera. How do they look? Are they red or irritated? 
How do they see? Is it any blurred vision or fluctuate, especially fluctuating vision? Do you have the urge to, or are you using artificial tears or re-wetting drops? And how much time do you spend on digital devices? Now, unfortunately, because of COVID, everybody's spending more than four hours on digital devices. So you kind of have to negate number five. But if you had number five with one of the others, it's time to start addressing that because there's probably an ocular surface issue going on. You're going to look at risk factors. Are they on antihistamines, all that stuff as well? But let's go into the testing. Do you have symptoms? I like the speed questionnaire or directed questionnaires just to know if there's symptoms there. What's your worst symptom? When is it worse? If you're going to do a speed questionnaire or DEQ5, they can do it before they even see you. And then you get into what's called homeostasis markers. So I'm giving you the best algorithm I know for managing ocular surface disease, but it's so important, especially lens fitting. So suppose you had a symptom. Now you need a sign. They recommend one of three testing. Either look at tear breakup time, look at osmolarity, or look at staining. Really, you only need one. Out of those three, I'd say staining. Staining gives me tear meniscus, which we're going to talk about in a moment. It gives me corneal staining, conjunctival staining, and tear breakup time, which is in there. That will do it. If you're extremely into dry eye, yeah, osmolarity becomes very valuable. If there's a fault of these tests, is that it doesn't really tell you which type of dry eye. Is this Sjogren's KCS? Is this just your meibomian gland dysfunction evaporative dry eye? So once one is positive though, and you know they have dry eye, then you have to differentiate which one it is. So the tests involve either things like osmolarity, tear breakup time, or ocular surface staining. Then you go into subtyping. There's only two types of dry eye we focus on. Keratoconjunctivitis sicko, which is, which is aqueous deficient forms. These are the patients you might do scleral lens fitting on, but a lot of other lenses would have difficulty. And evaporative dry eye, which is 86% of dry eye forms, and that's the one where the meibomian glands don't work. So how do you differentiate the subtype classification? Well, it's pretty straightforward. It goes back to what we talked about earlier. You got to express, and you got to look at the tear meniscus. If you express the oil glands and instead of olive oil, it comes out gelatinous like this or toothpaste like, as you're going to see here, then that tells me they have an evaporative form of dry eye. These patients can be managed before a specialty lenses to increase your success. And it's the most common form of dry eye. But again, this is gelatinous. This would be so three, a level three expression means olive oil. Two means gelatinous or turbid, like you saw here. One equals toothpaste and zero is non-expressive. If the oil glands are perfect, and that nasal to central area is expressing beautiful olive oil, then I start to look for staining and the tear meniscus height. I'll be honest, I don't sit there and measure the tear meniscus height. I don't say, oh, it's you know, 0.2 millimeters, that's pretty bad. I just know what a normal tear meniscus height looks like by looking at a whole bunch of contact lens wearing patients who are normal. And then when you see this really scant tear meniscus, you can pick up on what it is. One of the best interviews I ever heard was a lady who had won um, the top award, believe it or not, in Canada um, for, she was a nurse. She worked at Mount Sinai. She apparently had saved something like a thousand neonatal infants they expected, they estimated over her entire career. And they gave her this prime minister's medal, kind of one of the highest honors you can get up there. And I watched her interview and there was one story where, where every child in this high intensity neonatal ward had their own dedicated uh, nurse RN. And there was one time when this dedicated nurse was looking at a baby and following her and the baby's blood pressure was fine. The temperature was fine. The baby was sleeping properly. Um, they weren't, you know, crying or anything excessively, but enough. And she walked in as a supervisor and looked at this baby and said, oh my goodness, let me have that child lifted up the incubator, took the baby out, turned her over on her back, saw modeling on the back of, on her back, looked at her foot, saw crystallization formation where they had taken a blood sample and said, this is sepsis. Let's get this child on IVs, antibiotics, stat, and it saved the child's life. And you imagine a neonate that, you know, premature didn't have a lot of life with sepsis if it wasn't caught early. And the nurse said, I don't know how she knew that because I'm watching this child and everything on the vitals is normal. The child's eating properly, no temperature. And they interviewed her and she said, I just know what normal looks like. I thought, what a perfect answer. We don't measure tear meniscus. I don't measure tear break of time, but I know what normal looks like. So I'm able to instantly get a really good idea of if it's patho pathological or not. 
All right, I just gave you 77 pages of TFOS dues to diagnostic methodology, which includes over 600 references. And I gave it to you in about eight minutes. <laughs> Any questions on the diagnosis of ocular surface disease? Paul, that was uh, terrific. Uh, not the least of which I admire that you did work the Canadian connection in there as well. That was good. <laughs> that was for you, Craig. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is, what is the definitive test for Sjogren's? Great question. Um, ultimate, you know, there are actually some wonderful identifiers of Sjogren's syndrome. My favorite two are, um, let's go backwards. Pat is actually, this is Sjogren's patient. So uh, three things on this slide tell you the patient has Sjogren's. One is a patchy staining. Whenever you see patches like that, that's almost always autoimmune related. Typically Sjogren's on occasion, it could be SLA, it could be just an ANA that's positive, but typically it's Sjogren's and it'd be 95% of the time. Uh, number two, of course, the thin tear meniscus, but, but that's not specific to Sjogren's. Patchy staining is specific and temporal staining. Barbara Cafferty did a wonderful study that showed in the general population, it's very rare that you have more temporal conjunctival staining than nasal except 93% of Sjogren's patients have more temporal conjunctival staining than nasal. Pretty amazing study that, that you would get that much of a correlation. And I'm reminded of it every day. When I look at these Sjogren's patients, I'm like, you know, the temporal part of your conjunctiva is staining twice as much in nasal. Have you ever been tested for Sjogren's? Do you have a dry mouth? They all say, yes, we do our testing. It's positive. So that's your best. But the ultimate testing is lab testing, blood, blood serology. In which case you're looking for, per, there's this new test called the show test. Um, it's It's been around a couple years, but it's, it's it includes those more sensitive markers like parotid gland uh, markers, salivary gland markers, in addition to your SSA and your SSBs and your ANA. That's ultimately what's going to give you the, the answer. I no longer think lip biopsies are uh, an ideal test. These patients don't like them. They're not comfortable. The reason we did those is a lot of our SSAs and SSBs were negative until you got really advanced in the disease. So they would do a biopsy to confirm it earlier. Now we've got more sensitive testing. It's called a show test, SJO. It's a, just lab work, but it's a very specific algorithm or a very specific testing profile. And it picks up early Sjogren's as well. Okay, that's a terrific answer. Uh, one of the attendees has a question related to uh, an interest of his about starting a dry eye clinic. Great. And he said, do you think having um, an MGD expression device should come first or a mybographer device or Blefex? In other words, what order should we look into starting to invest in these technologies? Oh, I love hearing these questions. This encourages me so much for our profession because there's such a need for people getting into dry eye and specialty lenses. They actually go hand in hand. The ultimate treatment for dry eye disease is a scleral lens. So if you're already a specialty lens fitter, you adding, adding a dry eye specialty is the perfect next step because you'll treat more patients, you'll manage them more, and you'll use those contact lens skills to really make a difference. So my answer is expression. If you're looking at glaucoma, for example, the most important thing you can do is to look at the optic nerve. The most important thing you can do for diagnosing dry eyes is to look at the meibomian glands of what's coming out of them. I would just get a little inexpensive throw to paddle. I mean, they're what, $45 through Ocusoft? I guess maybe they've gone up, maybe it might be 65, but it's just a little paddle you put behind the eyelid. Bruder makes them, a bunch of companies make them. You know, they're, they're simple. You just put them behind, like I showed you in that image, you're going to get your expression. So it's a really inexpensive way of getting a really key piece of diagnosis. Um, my biography gives you the structure to go along with the function, which is expression, and function is still more important than structure. Uh, that's going to tell me more. So the next step would be that. Now, it's interesting that the doctor um, mentions my, you know, MBE, microblepharo exfoliation or BLEFX. That is a wonderful tool. And it's amazing how many patients have blepharitis, which we'll cover in a moment. So it becomes one of the most important treatment tools. But I still believe you got to have diagnosis before you can have treatment. So I would still put it in the order we just had. Okay, that's terrific. I think you've already addressed this one, but just, just to wrap up the questions from this segment, uh, should we be treating patients prior to fitting scleral lenses? And I think we know your answer already. I love, and the reason why this question is so perfect right now is because we're going to get into treatment right now. So the answer is yes. And here is my algorithm. It's taken me, you know, 
a couple of decades to refine this. And I will still admit that I'm still working on it. Every time I see patients, I'm constantly trying to find ways to get from 95% success to 97% success. But we, and I'm not exaggerating, I have a wonderful team here in Lexington, Kentucky. I, my 99% of my patients are referred from colleagues, ophthalmologists, optometrists, rheumatologists, um, oncologists, you know, where they've done bone marrow with grapho versus host disease. I've got a pretty cool clinic in the sense that patients come from all over now. And um, and so my goal is to take these severe patients and try and find ways to, to get higher success rates. And so I won't, I won't say I've mastered it, but I, I am really pleased with where we're at. If I go back to 15 years ago, I, I would kid you not, my success in dry eye management wasn't even 50%. I hate to admit that today, but literally half the patients came in would say, is there another doctor I could see <laughs> or someone else I could that could take over my care? It, we just didn't have a lot of options. I mean, cyclosporin has been around 18 years. That's it. We, we really didn't have the treatments. And today, I mean, we are literally over 95% success. So the, I think the key to that success comes from this. And this, in addition to specialty lenses, does extremely well. So the answer is absolutely. You have to have the two together. <clears throat> so this is my algorithm, um, which I rarely share, but I'm glad to get to do this. Uh, for evaporative dry eye. And it's not that I, I don't like to share. I love to share everything I've learned. That's, I mean, people have taught me everything like Don Corbs and Michael Lemp and Steve Flugler, so many people over the years, Joe Talbert, that, that the only thing I could do is give back. But but interestingly enough, in, in certain areas like review of optometry where I'm their chair of education, they don't let me teach on dry eye because they feel like I, uh, I work with too many dry companies. So I've never had a chance to really teach this. So getting this platform Craig is such an honor because I can share things that I've been waiting to share for decades. This is, um, or at least a decade, it hasn't been decades because this has really been in the last 10 or 12 years. This is my algorithm for evaporative dry eye, which is 86% of dry eye. If I go back, you know, 18 years ago, I, I treated only what's on the right. I treated the tear film. I put patients on artificial tears. I did punctal occlusion. And I wondered why <clears throat> they didn't get any better. Um, 18 years ago, we had the first approval, actually 19, because we're 2021 now. 19 years ago, we had a cyclosporin and restasis approved. So we started getting a little into inflammation. We were doing a little bit with omega fatty acids. So we covered that a little, but even then we weren't getting success. And we weren't getting success with specialty lenses in patients who had evaporative dry eye. It was only when we realized that they also had obstructed meibomian glands and typically blepharitis or biofilm. And we started addressing those that our success rate went above 90%. So this isn't as complex as it looks. Let me give you an example. A patient comes into your office, they're having contact lens intolerance issues. Number one reason for that is evaporative dry eye. This is my algorithm for evaporative dry eye. So what would I do in that patient? Well, from obstruction, I would put them on a moist heat compress. From biofilm, I do lid scrubs, which we're already doing a lot. For inflammation, I'd probably put them on an omega fatty acid like a GLA, HA, a GLA fish oil supplement. And I'd use maybe a rewetting drop or a lipid based tear to help them with their contact lens. That's not too complex. Omegas, lid scrubs, and hydrating compresses. And the success rate goes up. Now, if I've got no glands expressing, I'm looking more towards a scleral lens from the staining, other things are going on. Then for obstruction, I'm going to do a lid debridement and maybe a thermal expression. I might do blefex, as one doctor asked earlier, because there's just too much demodex and blepharitis there that's obstructing the issue or causing problems with the issues. I shouldn't use obstruction when that's one of the categories. For inflammation, I, I might start them on a combination. Maybe it is a immunomodulator. Maybe it is that combined with an omega fatty acid. And for the tear film, I'm probably going to use, you know, certainly Vermonity and to whiten the eyes perhaps or other things there, but I'm going to focus more on the obstruction, the biofilm or blepharitis and inflammation. So my point is the more severe, the more aggressive you get, but don't miss one of these elements. Having each one of these makes a huge impact in how you treat these patients. Now, this is not the algorithm for mucin or aqueous deficient dry eye, but 86% of dry eye involves the meibomian glands. And this is the algorithm for that category. So what's new? Lid debridement. Someone asked about tools. There's a tool I would get right away. Lid debridement and literally takes five to 10 seconds. You take a debrider tool. You can get these from all kinds of companies now, Brood or others. All you do is you just brush off the keratin that forms over the meibomian glands that prevents the oils from functioning. 
this is one of the, now this is obviously one of my first ones because here I am doing this for 30 seconds. It really takes about 10. Um, but it's amazing the patient response. I had a lady a few months ago who came into my office with MGD, diagnosed her with that, um, was able to treat her. She did so well when she came back a couple months later um, that I couldn't be, see all the keratin on there, all the biofilm, that's what's obstructing the glands and keeping them from functioning. When you remove this without anesthetic, because it feels so good, you don't want to use anesthetic. And hopefully you do a much more efficient job than I just did in that example. The patients will notice the improvement immediately. The oils start actually producing almost while you're doing it. This lady had come in for this two month follow up and she was doing perfect. So I just said, congratulations, you're doing so well. Let's maintain you on your lid scrubs, your hydrating compresses and your omega because she was a milder case. She got she drove 45 minutes in, for example, drove home, called my assistant, Carla, said who leads my clinic and said, Dr. Pecky didn't do that thing to my eyelids, which of course is debridement. I said, I guess I didn't. I mean, does she want to come back? And the patient said, yes, I'll come back. Drove 45 minutes back. I did a 10 second debridement. I took a little longer because she drove the whole way. I did do 30 seconds for her. She got back in her car and hit home. She drove three hours for a debridement. But that just gives you an example of the impact that has on these patients. Thermal expression, a lot of treatments. Do you go to this right away? This is more for a dedicated dry clinic where you want to do in-office procedures. The best analogy is the dental model. You do the in-office aggressive stuff and then you maintain it with your brushing and flossing, which is your scrubs and your hydrating compresses and your omega fatty acids. There's a lot of good technologies here. Blepharo exfoliation, glad I put this in here because someone already asked about it. I love blepharo exfoliation. It's a wonderful treatment to get rid of biofilm. See all that biofilm on the eyelid? See all the gloss there? That's all bacterial biofilm that occurs. Studies have shown it's present in the lashes in patients who have severe dry eye. Here's a patient with collarettes at the base of the lashes, classic for Demodex. Here's after Blefex. Now it looks like I induced some dermatoclasis. So let me lift up the eyelid here. You wouldn't even know they had that. It's amazing how well it can clear up the eyelashes to where nothing exists after a one and a half minute, two minute procedure. Hypochlorous acid, when do you use that? Well, a lot of people think that hypochlorous acid, which is a common lid hygiene product now, um, is ideal for Demodex. Actually, it doesn't work for Demodex. Uh, you're not going to get success. Fat Alan Cabot did a wonderful paper that where they put Demodex in a slide under the microscope and they put hypochlorous acid in there. And six hours later, the Demodex mites were still swimming around. I mean, they were doing the backstroke. They were so pleasantly uh, content. It does not take care of it. What works for that for Demodex is tea tree, uh, LLLT procedures, which we'll quickly touch on. Um, but for Staphylococcal blepharitis, hypochlorous acid is the best first treatment followed by your normal surfactant cleaners long term. Hypochlorous acid is actually chlorine, it's just a very low concentration, very similar to what our white blood cells would produce. But I still use that analogy. If I was to do laundry, I don't do laundry, but, but I should. But if I was to, um, I would use chlorine only in the bad stains, or at least that's how it's done. Um, and I would use soap all the other times. I do the same thing with eyelids. The really bad blepharitis, that's staphylococcal hypochlorous acid. Then I go to a surfactant cleaner long term. Omega fatty acids, I'm very partial to GLA with fish oil supplements. I've seen incredible results with that combination, but fish oil alone is also very effective. LLLT is kind of new. It goes along with IPL. So if you're really getting into dry eyes, called low light level therapy. It works by ATP production that gets the glands to work. But the reason why I put it in there is we're seeing so many more chalazian and hordeola than we've ever seen before because of our masks. The mask cause air to go up, which covers the glands with the dryness and that causes a sty. Hordeola are not from bad glands, they're from glands that can't get the stuff out. And so LLLT is a wonderful treatment to get rid of that, to get, take care of the issues related to that, to clear up Demodex as well. So if you ever hear the term low light level therapy, which is kind of new, or IPL, it does do a good job on these conditions. You often do a blue mask followed by a red mask. So this is for the more extreme dry eye clinic, but I really wanted to get into it. So that's treatment. And it goes perfectly with that wonderful question that was asked earlier. Do we pre-treat patients prior to scleral lens fitting? And the answer is yes. And those are your best examples of how to treat. Any questions on evaporative dry eye? Um. Paul, we just have one question that's related to this, and I b believe that you uh, actually may have answered this already. 
Uh, and that is, um, do you use Lodomax or other corticosteroids to treat inflammatory dry eye for short-term relief? Actually, I love this question because the most recent drug approval we've had is something called Isuvis, which is a 0.25% lodopredinol steroid. We've only had four drugs ever approved for dry eye. We've only had two ever approved for signs and symptoms of dry eye. This is the second one to get approved for signs and symptoms it's called Isuvis. It is lodopredinol and it's been approved by the FDA for up to two weeks of use QID. I have wonderful success with steroids. I, I tell every patient the most, the most effective treatment we have for your disease is steroids, but dry eyes chronic and steroids are not chronic. So we're gonna use it for the first two to four weeks because we know the impact it'll have, and then we'll save it for flare-ups. And that's the only way you use steroids. You use it at the beginning. If there's corneal staining, nothing will work better for resolving it other than steroids. If there's no staining, I don't think you necessarily need steroids. So staining is ST, ST, steroid staining. That's how I determine when I do steroids. And if there is staining, I have to start them on steroids. Nothing else addresses it quick enough. So the question is perfect. Let's get into the other form of dry eye real quickly. It's called aqueous deficient, which is where you have the little thin tear meniscus, the staining, conge, et cetera. Here's my algorithm for that. You'll notice there's no obstruction of the meibomian glands. There's no bacterial biofilm. It's really just what I call ITV, inflammation, tear volume. So it comes into play. Someone asked it perfectly. What about corticosteroids? It's like you guys were anticipating this presentation and you're like one slide ahead on every one of them. The last question, the first question was exactly before the slide we talked about that topic. The second one was right before we got into treatment. The third one is on steroids right before we get into steroids. So this new Isuvis Lodopredinol is actually, um, I think one of my top drops for short-term therapy to prepare the ocular surface as we need to. It's what's amazing is they had 1,430 patients in clinical trial, only two had an IOP rise. Lodopredinol, which is an ester steroid, is a safer steroid. We have esterases, they break it down. Ketonases like Pred Forte, Florum FML, Dexamethasone, we don't have ketonases, we can't break it down. So your safety profile is phenomenal with Lodopredinol when used for two to four weeks, and that's the way you need to use it. So this was the most recent approval um, for short-term flare-ups. It uses a mucus-penetrating mucus particle technology that actually is submicron, it's actually nano, uh, technology that allows it to get into the mucin. So mucin works to push away foreign products, including drugs. But if you can get the size small enough, it actually goes into the mucin pores and gets into the tissue. So they use that to their own advantage. And it has very successful results. In fact, it's the only drug in the category to be approved for dry eye disease. Punctal occlusion is another way to prepare the ocular surface for aqueous deficient form of dry eyes. You'll notice I didn't put punctal occlusion in evaporative dry eye. I don't get as good success there. I don't get success if they have allergies. I don't get success with punctal plugs if they have blepharitis or a lot of inflammation. But where I get a lot of success is if I control the inflammation, which is on your left, and then I plug in an aqueous deficient dry eye. I probably plug 90% of my aqueous deficient dry eyes. And I have moved away from the long-term plugs, the cauterization. My favorite approach is called a 180 day extended duration plug. And what I like about that is it's quick, it's efficient, and it keeps the tear functions going. So this is what it is right here. That I would also recommend you buy that, um, punctal plug four set because it's got a groove in it. So you can't crush these 180 day plugs. And these 180 day plugs actually last longer than six months. You also can't, you know, with jeweler's forceps, it flies away when you try to grab it. You just place it in. And these forceps have flat edges. So you can tap it down if you need to, to get it where you need to be. Fast, efficient, effective. Now, if every six months they notice a rise or dryer, I would do something more permanent. But this is really my first approach to specialty lens success in the aqueous deficient form of dry eye disease. There's even a new drug treatment for neurostimulation for some of these patients. The old form, you know, treatment called True Tear did not succeed, partly because you had to put it way up your nose. It was very expensive. But there's a new one they got approved just recently, like in the last few months. It's a sonic device that you place in your nasal area where it can stimulate the nasal branch of the trigeminal nerve, causing tears to function. And these patients had incredible functionality. In fact, here's a patient who we treated uh, with this. 
And in the clinical trials, I had seven patients in this trial. All seven purchased this device after approval. You'll notice at the beginning, the, the my bum is, is very gray, and that means not good quality. After about 10 seconds to 15 seconds of use, you see this classic oil slick, which is an indication of really good, high quality my bum. My bum is the most important layer to specialty lens success. So anything that can stimulate it becomes very effective. Amniotic membrane is more for your scleral lens cases, but don't hesitate to do a scleral lens followed by your specialty lens. I also include cytokine extract drops like Regenerize, which is exactly amniotic membrane in a bottle. So any of those fit into this category wonderfully. They have a lot of indications, not just dry eye. They're easy to fit. In fact, they're like fitting a contact lens. Have the patient look down place it under the eyelid, have them look up, place the over lower eyelid up, and you have it fit. Removal simply means nothing more than grabbing it with these forceps that are known as Procara forceps, which are designed to match the ring and pulling it out. There are dry forms, but you have to be a lot more selective in the dry forms. You have to look at things like Atlas and other ones like that that do work, but others don't tend to do as well, but they do work well. And I love cytokine extract drops, which are amniotic membrane essentially in a drop form like our Regenerize. That also fits into autologous serum as we have here. Ultimately, the perfect treatment for ocular surface, especially aqueous deficient dry eye, is believe it or not, a scleral lens. So it's amazing how everything comes full circle. We start with preparing the ocular surface by everything it's taken me 23 years to figure out. And we end with the most successful option for advanced ocular surface disease, which is a contact lens, no scleral lens. Isn't that amazing how all this comes together? Education is important. We can certainly cover a little of that because it's critical. Being able to show patients images of their eye helps in their understanding, but ultimately you gotta understand the ramifications of not treating or preparing the ocular surface. Start with the lid in mind. Think about OBIT, obstruction, biofilm, inflammation, tear film for evaporative dry eye. Inflammation and tear volume for aqueous deficient forms of dry eye where the tear meniscus is low. Be aggressive in your treatment, but cover every element. Count on higher specialty lens success with this regimen. You'll do extremely well. You already have the most important knowledge, the specialty lens area. Adding in the dry eye will only enhance the entire picture. And they work together. Managing severe dry eye and ocular surface disease requires scleral lenses. Managing specialty lenses requires controlling the ocular surface. So it all works beautifully together. All right, who am I wow. passing over to now? Bob, that was fantastic. And and Is we Jordan have some have some questions. Uh, but to before we answer those questions, we want to introduce Jonathan Midas and uh, Jordan Davidson, uh, who are going to talk a little bit about what some of these product categories right, are Craig, that are available. Me? at ABB. Yes. Thank you, Craig, and, it, and thank you, Dr. Karpecki. That was a, a great wealth of information. So as you mentioned early in the in the presentation, you know, ABB is always looking to oh, help the independent, independent ICPs. Um, our newest division is this portfolio of dry eye products. I'm, I'm going to talk about our, our three offerings now. So um, the first one's going to be Regenerized Light. And that's a biologic ophthalmic drop that has the proteins, the cytokines, the growth factors. Um, and they're really designed that the drop's designed to reduce inflammation, help protect the eye, heal and regenerate. And the reason ABB got into this space is the current market is about 1.8 billion with the uh, current other offerings, which is the Rostasis and the Zydras of the world. Um, and that model for an independent eye care practice doesn't create any revenue. Um, so what ABB is offering is this product's able to be sold through independent eye care practices. Um, it's not available in retail. And our model is simple, right? We can do it whether we ship it to a patient or we can ship it to your office. Um, we also have an inventory program that's happening right now. Um, you know, again, something that ABB looked at and, and saw this opportunity to help independents really focus on bringing that revenue back in the office rather than having it go out the door. On the next slide. We're going to talk about uh, Vibrant View, right? So this is a lid care protocol, and I know Dr. Karpecki talked a lot about uh, MGD. 
Um, and this is a two-pronged approach. Um, the first part is being performed in the office by the air care, eye care practitioner. Um, and it's a lid and lash debridement and moistening gel. And Dr. Karpecki actually referred to it perfectly, and we didn't set that up, I promise, but uh, <laughs> as, as going to the dentist, right? So it's like getting your teeth cleaned. Um, and then the patient would actually take home uh, a maintenance spray, and they would use that daily. And again, just like uh, brushing your teeth every day, um, you know, requires continuous cleaning and care. Um, so that's another opportunity for a retail um, revenue generating product that we offer. And then the next one we're going to talk about is um, the eye leave mask by Bruder. Um, and I think we've talked about a little bit about that during the presentation also. Um, you know, it's a moist heat mask that produce, um, promotes lubrication, stimulating the glands. Um, it can extend the wearing time of contact lenses by up to three hours daily. We know that's a, a big issue with dry eyes. The patients drop out of contact lenses. Um, you know, it, it reduces the, repels the bacteria and the, the, the mask is comfortable. It has the comfort stitch, stitch excuse me, to, to keep pressure off the eyelid. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about our scleral offerings or our specialty offerings on the next slide. So ABB Specialty Lens Division, um, you know, we have the largest portfolio of, of, of specialty lenses in the industry. And we really focus a lot on the educational resource, much like we're doing today. Um, but for the specialty lenses, we, we have the scleral lenses. We have many different sclerals. We have our ortho K, um, our spherical, our hybrids. Um, custom soft lenses, bifocal, multifocal, um, you know, some of the irregular cornea lenses. Um, and the next person that's going to be talking with you is, is going to be Jordan Davidson, who is one of our consultants, one of our 12 consultants that works for ABB. Um, she is also ABB's resident dry eye specialist. And she's going to talk to you guys a little bit more about some of our scleral designs. Oop. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Um, along with our scleral lens um, designs, we also have our prime warranty that's available. And this allows you to make the exchanges that you need to really get the proper fit with your sclerals. Um, as you'll see in the next slide, we have a very large portfolio of scleral lenses that are available, including the Boston Sight, the ICD Flex, and the Europa, which can all be used with your dry eye patients. Um, you'll see I also get to work alongside a wonderful group of consultants. And these consultants are really experts in all areas of specialty lenses. Not only are we here to help you design lenses, but we can also help increase your fitting techniques and grow your business. One of the new things that we're offering that you'll see on the next slide is a new scleral lens starter kit. Um, all of our um, scleral lens starter kits will actually go out with your new scleral lens patients, and they're also available for purchase. We really tried to include everything that your patient will need to get started with their new lenses, just like an inserter, remover, contact lens case, and also, as you'll see, the new Vibrant View scleral saline, which is going to be the preservative-free saline that your patient can use for insertion. It will also include... Um, the Tangible Clean, which is a daily disinfecting solution that helps protect the hydroped coating as well. One of the um, different things that ABV offers is educational opportunities. We provide virtual lunch and learns um, for you and your staff. We have contact lens specific education that is really helpful if you're getting started with scleral lenses or if you just want to get to know more about a specific scleral lens. We now offer dry eye education, such as adding dry eye into your practice, an in-depth look at our dry eye portfolio, and basic dry eye education for your staff. You can reach out to your sales rep to schedule um, or contact us through customer service consultation and we'll get you in the right direction. And the last thing um, is, of course, our live webinars, and we're already ready for our July webinar um, with Dr. Gallagher. These are recorded and available on ABB's website. We can provide virtual wet labs, virtual fits, and we have a live chat available on our website for help. Okay, uh, thank you to both of you, but don't run away yet uh, for the attendees and for, for sure for Jordan and Jonathan as well. We have uh, uh, some questions that we would like to use the few minutes that we have left to uh, talk about. Uh, Dr. Karpecki, the first question is, Will you go over the uh, OBIT versus ITV? Exactly what does this mean? Yeah, I'd love to, because it really was a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. So 
the, the key, as we talked about the diagnosis, is to determine the type of dry eye. So, um, and I'll get into the two forms. So if you look at uh, an evaporative form of dry eye, which is the large majority where the meibomian glands are just not functioning well, the key differentiator to diagnosing that is expression. If, if, it come, if the oils coming out of the lower central to nasal eyelid glands are perfect olive oil, then that's normal. If it's toothpaste, if it's gelatinous or turbid or gel-like, or if nothing's coming out of them, then we know we have an issue. And when you press, you just kind of press on the bottom and work your way up, almost like milk in the glands a little bit. Very gentle pressure is all it requires to see what's coming out. If you have an evaporative dry eye, you're going to almost always have obstructed meibomian glands, which you just tested for. You'll likely have biofilm or blepharitis because when your oils aren't good or your blink's not good, you can't wash away the bacteria. Remember, when we blink, our eyelids not only pump the oil glands, they actually if you watch an eye tomorrow and you watch the patient blink, you'll notice that the lower eyelid moves in. That's a cleaning mechanism. So it's very common in patients with poor blink habits or too much digital device who have evaporative dry eye also have biofilm or blepharitis. So you have to address that. That's the B in OBIT. The I is inflammation and the tear, T is tear film. Meaning that if you don't do something for each of those elements, your success goes down dramatically. So we were taught in school, you stepped up. You started with artificial tears. If that didn't work, you added a cyclosporin, neuralophytograss. If that didn't work, you then bumped up to an oral tetracycline. If that didn't work, you might take care of a, of a brooder mask. If that didn't work, you would add in, that's, you, the patients aren't gonna stick around for that anymore. That's just not going to happen. You have to address each element to be successful. Obstruction, treat one element. Maybe it is your brooder eye leaf. Biofilm, Maybe it's your lid scrubs like you saw that, that Jordan presented. Inflammation, maybe it's an omega fatty acid. Tear film, it's a lipid tear. But you got to get one in each category to have success. Aqueous deficient dry eye is where the oil glands are working beautifully. You express them and olive oil comes out. But you look at the eye and you see corneal and conjunctival staining. You see a really thin tear meniscus. That's your Sjogren's. That's your keratoconjunctivitis sicca. So the treatment algorithm for that form of dry eye doesn't involve obstruction or biofilm, because they're typically not there. It involves ITV, inflammation control, tear volume accentuation or increase. That's how you manage that. That's why punctal plugs, which are a wonderful treatment for aqueous deficient dry eye, increase tear volume. It fits in the ITV. I rarely plug an aqueous uh, evaporative dry eye with my bony gland dysfunction. Can't imagine plugging someone with ocular rosacea and dry eye. I would just inflame them more. So, or bad blepharitis, I would keep all that stuff around. So punctal plugs don't work in evaporative forms. They don't fit into OBIT, but they sure fit into ITV. So the type of dry eye dictates what you use and how you treat it. And your success will go up with specialty lenses when you determine which type of dry eye and what's the best treatment for them. So for evaporative, my bowman gland related dry eye, it's obstruction, biofilm, inflammation, tear film, OBIT. For aqueous deficient and Sjogren's and KCS, it's ITV, inflammation, tear volume. Excellent. A um, couple of additional questions before we sign off. Uh, one is, what is your dry eye follow-up schedule? I mean, do you have a boilerplate that you would like to use and yeah, modify wonderful. from there? Wonderful question. So, uh, because it, that is important. You don't want to go too long that patients may get discouraged or not continue to be compliant. You don't want to go too short that you don't allow the treatments to work. The average is a month when I see the patient back. If they're on a steroid, I have no choice. I have to see them in three to four weeks just to check pressures. Even though I'm stopping the steroid at no more than four weeks typically, I still want to just make sure they're not a steroid responder because they're still going to use steroids for flare-ups here and there. And I don't want them getting a, a flare-up of their IOP. So I still want to check them in that time. So the exception is if I start with steroids, then it's a three to four week follow up. But without steroids, I go four to six weeks. I really want to let this stuff work. Omegas take six weeks, for example, like a hydro eye or something like that. Uh, for them to get in the habit of lid scrubs and their brooder eye leave, it does take a little bit of time. I think if we, if we you know, when you were young, we learned to brush and floss. So, so we, especially brushing, so we get in the habit of it. And then flossing, like I can't imagine not doing that because I learned it early. We don't learn to do lid hygiene early. So it does take patients a little time. Omegas take that time, like I said, 
the anti-inflammatories that are not steroids take even longer to kind of work. So I typically, if I'm using a steroid, it's three to four weeks. If I'm not using a steroid, it's four to six weeks. Okay, that, that is terrific. Uh, here's a product-related uh, question that came up that you had mentioned that you used Regenerize uh, in your presentation. Jonathan mentioned the use of Regenerize Light. Is, it can, is there a time when you use one versus the other? I think, mean, yes, a great question. Um, I'm a big fan of it. I've been amazed at the response our patients have had. Jordan was actually in my office one day where in that one day, and, and granted, we see a lot of patients. I think we had like 44 or something, but we literally had 14 patients we had on Regenerize that day that were new to it. That's just the kind of response we, we've had. It wasn't because she was there. It's just typical of how the success we have. So I would say of that group, um, probably 12 to 14 were light. I, I just have great success with that. It's got a wonderful shelf life. It's extremely effective. It's very... Uh, it's not a significant cost at around $75. Patients do very well with that um, for what they're getting. It's, it's cytokine extract, it's amniotic membrane, all that involved in it. So they do really well. Now, if I have a graft versus host, severe KCS, uh, corneal melts, persistent epithelial defects, I'll do the full strength and I do get great results. But for all the other patients, it's the light version. For dry eye, it's the light version. It's just another wonderful alternative to the cyclosporins and the immunomodulators, and I think it's a little bit more effective because of the way that it works from a from a cytokine extra, meaning an anti-inflammatory perspective that's a little more natural. If you think about the amniotic membrane, the way it works is it, it really allows regeneration of the of the tissue, whether it's the child developing in the amniotic sac or whether it's the involved in a drop to help the ocular surface. And so um, I get away with the light. I like the long uh, shelf life. I like the ease of use, the non-refrigeration. But if I have a severe GVHD patient, if I have a really severe, perhaps extensive on the Sjogren's other, then I will look to the full strength. Okay, great. Um, I'd like to close with uh, one more. Uh, with the use of more blue light devices, yeah. would you begin pretreatment for younger patients for potential dry eye issues? That's an impressive question. You know, I, when I first started looking at blue light, I was kind of skeptical. I knew the research suggested that it does affect our circadian rhythms. And I granted, I accepted that. I, I do know people who spend, you know, at nighttime getting on their iPads and their phones don't sleep as well. And so I, I got that. But the new research and the more I see it, the more I do realize it has a huge, significant impact on eye strain, on dry eye, and even potentially on the macula and, and its issues long-term. So I love that someone knows enough to ask this question um, involved in it. I believe we're gonna look back 10 or 20 years from now and say, yes, we needed to do more because of these stimuli that are present, uh, because of the blue light that we're being exposed to that we typically would never be exposed to in an evening, for example. So um, it, I, I do think it plays a role. I also think that when you're exposed to blue light, you don't blink as often, which leads to much more evaporative forms of dry eye and meibomian gland dysfunction. So they, they all really go together. So the answer is absolutely. The average patient in the COVID era, or average person, uh, spends over 13 hours a day on digital devices. That used to be about nine. Post-COVID, it got to 13, which is incredible percentage increase. So with that, they're going to get more evaporative dry eye. They're going to get more meibomian gland dysfunction. They're going to get more drying effects. They're probably going to have other issues around asthenopia. So the answer is yes. If we should now be starting to think about the importance of managing these patients early because we know the consequences long-term. So what a terrific question. Okay, that is great. Um, so, Paul, as we get at, uh, to wrapping this up, I would just like to mention to the attendees that the recording of this will be up on the ABB Optical site coming up in just a couple of days. Uh, you can expect to be able to view that at that time. Uh, that there was a question related to a handout, and there will be some level of a handout accompanying that as well. When that goes up online, you will be communicated from uh, with somebody at ABB that it is available uh, at that point. You can see in front of you how you can reach Dr. Karpecki directly if you would like to uh, chat with him. And I also want to thank Jonathan Medes uh, and Jordan Davidson for their input uh, this evening as well. Uh, Paul, this was fantastic. And just lis listening to um, 
the high tech involvement on how dry eye is treated today is amazing to me. And for people that are uh, just recently out of school in the last 10 years, they would think that it's been as technologically advanced like this for a long time. But we've come a long way from the days where dry eye was treated by giving the patient a handful of lubricants and saying, check these guys out, I'll see you in three months. Uh, it's fascinating to see where the technology and the industry has uh, gone. That was a perfect summary, Craig. Could not say it any better. It is incredible the speed of advancement we're at. And what we did, you know, five, ten years ago seems so archaic today. And and really the goal tonight is to to skip ten years of trying to figure this out the hard way and really taking what we've got, realizing what you can do and having a huge impact on your patients and your specialty lens success. Yeah, terrific. Dr. Karpecki, thank you again. Paul, it's always great to uh, be able to enlighten listeners on your vast knowledge, and I think that everybody's time is well worth spent tonight. Thank you very much, and we are now signing off. Good luck, everybody. Night. Thank you.